What is up, everyone? Uh, this is Mr. Frisa, and welcome to uh, your first screencast uh, in class. This is um, your second assignment. You just got done listening to the wonderful Hank Green and the crash course, and some of the things are going to kind of mirror that. And just so you know, um, you don't have to write down any notes. Um, I'm going to teach you how we teach notes in psychology uh, once the school year begins. But really, if there's things you want to jot down, I think it's a good idea, but you can always hit that pause button. Um, as you're doing your assignments. So what exactly is um, this assignment about today? Well, it's really about the history of psychology. So, so you know, I'm a social studies teacher and, and uh, I love history. And I also love the field of psychology. So there is a history behind it that goes way back to none other than these people. And who are these people? They're the Greeks, all right? Very good, you're probably thinking that, I'm sure. All right. Um, it, it, listen, as long as there's been humans, there's been people interested in the people's behavior or behavior themselves for that matter. Like, why did I do that? Or why did that person do that? Uh, so Greek, be, you know, Greek, you know, philosophers, they, they pondered this human behavior and they came up with this idea of a thing called introspection, which means looking in. Um, and too often, you know, when you think about it, you're really also busy with their lives. You never stop and look at the person in the mirror. And uh, you don't ever get a chance to reflect on your thoughts or behaviors. Well, introspection kind of forces you to do that. And um, you gain insight into yourselves. And then that insight into yourself gives insight into others. So all three of these Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, uh, were already tackling the key issues in psychology. For example, uh, you know, is intelligence and other aspects, aspects of our personality uh, are they present at birth or whether it's learned throughout your environment? Uh, so the Greeks were kind of tackling the mind-body issue and all that stuff. But it wasn't until this guy. This guy is Sir Francis Bacon. He developed the scientific method, which is going to be your best friend this year. It's the same scientific method you learned back in middle school. Basically, it's using modern empiricism. And what exactly is that? It's just basically what you're going to do is you're going to rely on observation and experimentation to come to your conclusions. Many of you at times this year are going to say, yeah, but in my house, that's great. That's anecdotal. Okay. It happens to you, but it doesn't happen to the person next to you. It's kind of like these little spinner crazies that are going on right now. They're marketed as something that helps autistic or kids that have attention issues, but there's been no studies on it. There's been no evidence on empiricism. It's just people saying, yeah, they help or no, I'm completely mesmerized by it. I'm not paying attention to my teacher. So the modern psychology uh, was really founded in um, uh, the late 1870s, specifically in Leipzig, Germany, or uh, under Wilhelm Wundt. All right. And he established the first psychological experimental lab. He was an introspection labs observations. Um, and basically, the emphasis was placed on the study of introspection through the controlled and disciplined observation of one's own mind. Wundt com combined philosophical intro introspection excuse me, uh, with techniques and laboratory apparatuses. So Wundt argued that we can learn little about our minds from casual, haphazard self-observation. It is essential that observation be made by trained observers under careful, sp specific conditions for the purpose of answering a well-defined question. Wow, that's a tongue full, isn't it? So, you know, their machine measured a time lag between people's hearing a ball hit a platform and they're pressing a telegraph key, okay? So, and so the idea here is that they were looking at how they were thinking. And this guy named Edward Titchener, he developed this concept called structuralism. And there's, the conscious experience is broken into two parts, the objective sensations and the subjective feelings, all right? He was a student of, of um, this structuralist idea. And, um, you know, so objective sensations like sight, taste, were seen as accurately representing the outside world, whereas subjective feelings were thoughts included emotional responses and mental images. So the human mind combined these elements and experiences. So you're probably wondering, we have an apple. Okay, so let's look at an apple. A person can experience an apple objectively by observing its shape, color, texture, and taste. But a person can also experience an apple subjectively by remembering how good it feels to bite into it, or for that matter, how bad it tastes. The subjective part is going to be different in different people. 
And I think that's where the structuralists were kind of go after. Do you see anything in this picture? I do. I see a, I see a dog bending over. All right. Let's go back to that. See the dog right here? Okay, so there's his little ear flap. He's bending over, drinking out of the water. It's his front hind leg, his other front leg, back leg. Okay, it's right over here. Okay. This gestalt, you know, historical period is was really remembered for consciousness, can be best understood by observing it as a total experience rather than breaking it down. Okay. Um, so it's based on the idea that perceptions are more than the sums of their parts. They are instead holes that give shape or meaning the parts. Where structuralism breaks down consciousness, Gestalt rejects the breaks, you know, Gestalt breaks them down, so to speak. Have you ever noticed how a series of flashing lights can often appear to be moving, such as neon lights and strands of Christmas lights? They're not really moving, they're just kind of blinking, but they give you that perceptual illusion that they're moving. Okay, according to the Gestalt psychology, this apparent movement happens because our minds fill in the missing information. This belief that the whole is greater than the sum of the individual parts led to the discovery of several different phenomena that occurred during perception. Okay, so this is a Dalmatian, as you know. Okay, um, we circles rather than random dotted line. We see holes rather than their parts. Okay, so we see a circle there. We see a square, even though there's not really a circle or square there, but we just kind of fill that stuff in. What do we see here? This is the famous picture, I believe it was an Eastman picture actually, of the horse actually leaving the ground. Most people don't realize that a horse actually, how four of the legs when they're running do leave the ground. So William James come, one of the most prominent uh, psychologists in the United States. And, and James looks at, he looked at Darwin studies and believed that consciousness or thinking was like a bird's wings or a cheetah's legs. It developed through the evolution in humans as a form of survival. Consciousness serves a function. It enables us to consider our past, adjust to our present circumstances, and plan our future. He encouraged explorations of down-to-earth emotions, memories, willpower, habits, and moment-to-moment -moment streams of consciousness. Because James thought that the function of sensations, ideas, and memories was important, his view became known as functionalism. Here's my man, Dr. Sigmund Freud. He was a doctor, or he was also a physician, okay? And he noticed that some of the patients displayed a physical problems did not have any apparent physical cause. He found as people began talking about their daily problems or stresses, their physical ailments began to disappear. He also began using hypnosis and other methods to discover stresses and, uh, and memories that his patients were unaware of. That's the key word, unaware. He said, these lie in the subconscious and must be drawn out by certain techniques. So classic, tell me about your mother. One of the funnier things about live TV is how fast an innocent moment can become X-rated with an accidental slip of the tongue. Take a look at these folks who meant one thing, but unfortunately said another. the president for seven and a half years I've worked alongside him and I'm proud to have been his partner and we've had trials we've made some mistakes we've had some sex setbacks Oops. this is a KMAC action news update the Portales City Commission will meet Monday with an elevator firm to determine what to do about the old elevator at the Roosevelt County Jail it seems after 45 years it's dangerous to get it up in Portales Now, of all the world's birds, the humble pigeon doesn't usually generate much excrement. <laughs> so there's a bunch of different things that you can actually do right here. Um, Freud, uh, you know, you know, that's called a Freudian slip, and and um, you know, and that was the psychodynamic part of psychology. Now, you know, we're talking about things that are all inside right now, unconscious in the brain. You know, so I want you to picture this, a rat in a maze. A hungry rat is cruising through a maze and moves along until it reaches a place where it must turn left or right. If the rat is consistently rewarded for food for turning right at that place, it will learn to turn right when it arrives there. But what does a rat think when it's learning to turn right at the place 
you know, it, it replaces the maze. Okay. So this is like a little thing, which way do I go? 